let's go ahead and go to John chapter 13. John chapter 13. Let's go ahead and start reading in verse 1. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour was come, that he should depart out of this world unto the Father, having loved his own, which were in the world, he loved them unto the end. And supper being ended, the devil having now put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he was come from God and went to God, he riseth from supper and laid aside his garments and took a towel and girded himself. After that, he poureth water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel wherewith he was girded. And right now, I want to stop right there and just show how right here we see an amazing picture. You know, just picture Jesus. You know, he's laid aside his garments. He's girded with the towel. He's going and washing the disciples' feet. I mean, how humiliating, I mean, just humbling that is, you know, to wash someone's feet like that. And he's doing this, you know, he's trying to teach them an important lesson. I think the lesson right here he's trying to teach is pretty obvious. You know, he's trying to teach them about loving each other, about serving each other. If you go to the end, let's go and skip real quick to verse 34. I want to show you what he says here. After he goes through all this, uh, in verse 34, he says, A new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one to another. Jesus, he, did, he wanted to teach them how important it was for them to love each other, for them to serve each other. What was one of the big conflicts the disciples always had? It was that, who's the greatest, wasn't it? They were always arguing over who's going to be the greatest. Remember when James and John's mother came to Jesus? You know, grant that one can sit in your right hand and one in your left in the kingdom. All the other disciples got mad. Why? Because, no, I deserve that spot. And they were, they were always arguing about that. And Jesus, his uh, ministry here on earth is almost over. And he's wanting to teach them a very important lesson that they were going to need. And, you know, service is one of the best ways that you can show your love for someone. And G, I mean, and especially lowly service like that, you know, and it, and it is, you know, one of the best ways you can make friends with someone is working alongside them, isn't it? I mean, that's, that's just when you can really bond with somebody. And when somebody uh, works with you or works for you, you know, expecting nothing in return, you know, they're just wanting to help. I mean, I, it really does. It really shows love. You mean, talk about putting your money where your mouth is. You know, when you will go and just serve. And Jesus here, he wasn't giving, I don't believe that feet washing is a New Testament ordinance. All right. There are some churches that believe, because, you know, it was also uh, this time when Jesus did the Last Supper, wasn't it? And so some people teach, and some churches actually practice. Foot washing. They have, you know, baptism is one of the ordinances. They have the Lord's Supper and they actually have foot washing in the church and they will do that. And the church people will wash each other's feet. Now, I'm thankful we don't do that. But you know what? Um, Jesus here, he's not setting up an ordinance of having a practice of foot washing in church. He's setting an example of loving one another. Amen. And I think proof that this is not supposed to be something that we actually practice, you know, in church all the time. Uh, in 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse 9, uh, you can turn over there if you want to. 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse 9, it says, Let not a widow be taken into the number under threescore years old, having been the wife of one man, well reported of for good works, if she have brought up children, if she have lodged strangers, if she have washed the saints' feet. You all see that? If she's done that. What's he saying? It's saying if, you know, if she's been a servant, if she's somebody who has served, who has done you know, the lowly tasks, you know, that kind of person is one you can take in. Well, if foot washing was an ordinance in the church, then wouldn't the feet washing thing cover everybody? You know, so obviously it wasn't something that everybody did. Otherwise, he wouldn't have specified you know, someone who's washed the saint's feet. It mentioned that because the type of people that you want in the church, the type of people that you want in the ministry, no matter what position it is, it's people who are servants. Okay. And we're going to see too, you know, this, if this isn't about being a big shot, a lot of people, they get involved in church and they want positions in church because they want to be a big shot. 
But listen, the ministry is no place for big shots. The ministry is a place for servants. And you know what? The church is no place for big shots. The church is a place for servants where we serve one another, where we love one another. And someone who is going to be an actual, you know, I guess what we call today an employee or something in a church, it needs to be someone who's washed the saints feet, figuratively speaking, someone who's done the lowly task, somebody who won't even clean the bathrooms in a church is not somebody that you should have in any type of position in the church. We need people who are willing to do the lowly things. And so I think 1 Timothy 5, 9, and 10 proves right there that this is, that is not something we need to practice. Okay, We are not going to have foot washings here in this church. Okay, Amen. And I'm, I'm thankful for that. And if you all saw my feet, you would be thankful for that too. And so, uh, But a person, though, they're not supposed to make a show about their service. Okay, That's not what this is either. Okay, and, you know, when Jesus did this, this was something he did, you know, amongst his disciples. This was something that was done behind closed doors. Jesus was not making a show. He was trying to set an example. He was trying to, he was trying to teach them a lesson. And I, I actually preached a message years ago. I was at a camp meeting. And in camp meetings, you know, there's all kinds of crazy people at camp meetings. And there was this one guy in particular. I always remember this guy. I won't, I won't say his name or anything. He was a good guy, but he was kind of a goofball. And um, I preached a message from this passage talking about serving others and everything. And he came up to me after church. He's like, man, brother, that was, that was such a good message. He's like, you know, I, I, years ago, I, I preached a message on that very thing at a camp meeting. And I just, I felt so moved. I actually went in the service and I washed the pastor's feet. And I'm, let me tell you, it was humbling, brother. It was humbling. And I thought... Okay, that's kind of weird. <laughs> but second of all, you know, okay, if you're preaching a sermon and in the middle of your sermon, you stop and you go wash the pastor's feet. First of all, I felt sorry for that pastor. All right. If we ever have a guest speaker that tries that, I don't know what I'm going to do. But <laughs> I mean, that had to have been weird. And isn't that just kind of putting on a show? And listen, when you got a, uh, you know, your service, it is, it's not something we put on display. It's not something we do to... I uh, draw attention to ourselves. I remember years, years ago, there's a guy in my dad's church and uh, my dad had preached a message on service and he, about being a servant and talked a lot about these same things. You know, this isn't about being big shots. A lot of people, they want the positions, you know, they want, you know, they, you know, they want to be in the spotlight and things like that, but you need to be a servant. And this one guy who was desperate to always be in the spotlight he decided, you know, he was going to take that serious and he was going to be a servant. And so one day, like right after the service, you know, people are still around the church and congregating and everything. And he's like going through the auditorium, vacuuming and like, you know, kind of getting people out of his way. You know, it was just awkward. There's people all over the place. And he's like trying to vacuum the floor and clean everything up in the auditorium. And people are just like, what are you doing? Just being a servant. Just being a servant. <laughs> I'm not lying. That's exactly what he did. And he's like, nope, we gotta be, yeah, we're supposed to be a servant. And he's there cleaning up. And he's being a real pain in the neck. You know, he's cleaning up in a way where everybody knows he's cleaning up. You know, he, he's kind of being a nuisance to everybody. He's just walking up. I, I'm not lying. He goes walking off, just being a servant. Servant. Ah, I'm not lying. I'll never forget that. I know that sounds exaggerated. That is exactly what happened. And my family, they, they probably know who I'm talking about. And they know I'm not exaggerating one bit. That's, listen, that, that's not what Jesus was trying to teach him right there. Okay, This isn't about putting on a show. But listen, we should serve one another. We should be willing to do the lowly things. And it's not, once again, it's not just about serving and doing the work, but it's about loving each other. About lo- loving each other. And you know, think about you know, once a parent, you know, a, the love of a mother for a child. You know, there is no greater love. And proof of that, you know, look at all the things a mother has to do for a baby. You know, just changing diapers. You know, that's a that's a pretty disgusting task sometimes. You know, my kids, they've produced some abominations before that have been really bad and been a huge pain in the neck for my wife. And but you know, they take care of those things. Parents, they don't leave their kids in that situation because they love them. They need to be cleaned up, they need to help them. And it, you know, it's what we do and sometimes people they need help, you know, thankfully, you know, don't we have to worry about diapers and things like that, but you know what? Sometimes you got to do some lowly tasks. You might have to do some physical labor. And we need to be willing to humble ourselves and do what needs to be done. And so look at verse 6. He says, Then cometh he to Simon Peter 
And Peter saith unto him, Lord, dost thou wash my feet? Jesus answered and said unto him, What I do thou knowest not now, but thou shalt know hereafter. Peter saith unto him, Thou shalt never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I wash thee not, thou hast no part with me. Simon Peter saith unto him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus saith to him, He that is washed needeth not save to wash his feet, but is clean every whit, and ye are clean, but not all. For he knew who should betray him, therefore he said, Ye are not all clean. What all is happening right here? Okay, so Peter, and this, this is important, you need to get this, okay? Because Jesus is trying to teach an important lesson that I'm afraid many Baptists have not got. And he, Jesus comes to Peter, he's been washing people's feet, but he gets to him and Peter's like, no, you're not going to wash my feet. Now, I think it's easy, pretty easy to understand what Peter was doing. You know, you know, hey, you're the master and Lord. You won't wash my feet. You know, let me wash your feet is, is kind of his attitude. And Jesus tells him, hey, if, if I don't wash your feet, you have no part with me. Now, why would it have been a problem if Jesus didn't wash Peter's feet? You know, what if Jesus would have said, you know what, you're right, Peter. I'm not going to wash your feet. You know what, Peter? You wash my feet. See, because Jesus, notice what he says here. Um, lost my spot. Or, he's, or later, he says, I don't want to get ahead of myself. But Jesus was our master and Lord. Okay? That's the title tonight. Jesus Christ, Master and Lord. That's who Jesus was. He was their Master and Lord. No doubt about it. But the Master and Lord is setting an example showing that, you know what? No one is above anyone else. And if Jesus would have not washed Peter's feet, then it would have been, then Peter later, who was a leader, you could say, amongst the disciples, Jesus never really gave anybody top billing. But if we were going to give it to one of them, we would probably give it to Peter, wouldn't we? He, he seemed to be kind of one that they all kind of looked to oftentimes. And it would have been real easy for Peter to try to claim the role of, now that Jesus is gone, there's a new sheriff in town. I'm the boss. And you know what? It would, you know, he, it would have been easy for him to have the attitude that, you know what? I'm not washing anybody's feet. Jesus, who was master and Lord, didn't wash my feet. And I'm not going to wash their feet. But is that what Jesus wanted? No, Jesus was trying to show them, listen, none of us here, none of you here are above anyone else. There was no doubt that Jesus was above all of them. But yet Jesus lowered himself to their level, was willing to serve them, was willing to do the lowly task. And he did that. That way later on when he wasn't there, Whenever, you know, they did become a big shot. When Peter's preaching and 3,000 people are getting saved on Pentecost, you know, and he, they start to get a big following, he doesn't start thinking, yeah, I'm a big shot. I'm what it's all about. No, he wanted to make sure he stayed a servant and that he stayed lowly and humble in mind. I mean, I, I would think, and I think, it, I think it served its purpose with the disciples, even with Peter, that, you know, Peter never, you know, if, if Jesus Christ himself had washed your feet at one time, wouldn't that make you feel like scum later on if you're acting like a big shot when Jesus himself didn't even do that? And so it was. It was important that Jesus washed Peter's feet. He needed to learn this lesson. And I do. I think it would have, uh, it would have messed everything up if Jesus would have skipped Peter and said, no, you're right. Or if Peter even would have said, if he would have told Peter, you know what, go ahead, you wash my feet. Because then, later on, when Jesus is gone, Peter's the new sheriff in town, he can start demanding everybody wash his feet. Hey, I washed the Savior's feet, now you wash my feet. And, and you know that would have happened. Okay, That's just human nature. And because people have forgotten this lesson, this type of thing goes on in Christianity all the time. And even amongst Baptists, it's, it's absolutely ridiculous. And so he, Jesus is trying to teach his disciples here that there are no big shots. Okay? No big shots. And Jesus wants servants, not big shots. Matthew chapter 20, verse 27. And whosoever will be chief among you, let him be your servant. For even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, 
He didn't come so people could minister to him, so people could serve him. He came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and give his life a ransom for many. That's why Jesus came. Jesus didn't come to be the big shot. Jesus came to serve. Now, because of that, we're going to see later that God hath highly exalted him and given him a name above every name. And one of these days, he's going to come back and rule and reign. But understand that is not what he did that first time he came. And that is not what we're supposed to do at any time in this life. It is not about being a big shot. Jesus wants servants, people who do lowly things. If you ever get the attitude, I'm too good for any job in the church. You know what? You got no business doing any job in the church. We don't need big shots. We need servants. And so if Jesus hadn't washed Peter's feet, he would have been sending a wrong message. He'd have been sending a message that there are some who shouldn't have to serve. Everybody needs to be willing to serve. Everybody needs to be willing to do the work, get dirty, whatever needs to be done. And notice too, Jesus, he washed all their feet, didn't he? And you'll notice too, it said in the beginning of the chapter that Satan had already put it into the heart of Judas to betray Jesus, didn't he? But you know what? Jesus washed Judas' feet too. Jesus washed Peter's feet, who we're going to see at the end of the chapter. Jesus said, you're going to betray me. Jesus washed the feet. Jesus served even those who would betray him and who would deny or betray him and who would deny him. And you know what? That happens in church too. Sometimes, you know, we get to looking around and a lot of times we don't trust somebody in the church. Well, you know, I don't think I can count on that person. I don't have to serve them. I can count on these people though. Well, wait a minute. Jesus knew for a fact that he couldn't count on some of them. In fact, really all of the disciples, they ran Whenever Jesus got taken, Jesus knew these things were going to happen, but it didn't stop him from serving him. And we can't have that attitude that we get to pick and choose who we serve in the church. We need to be willing to serve everyone. We need to be willing to be a servant of all. You see that? You see that uh, phrase used in the Bible? And so Jesus did. He served those who were going to betray him and those who were going to deny him. It was already in their heart. And he didn't stop it. And many times we do. We will let just what we think is in somebody's heart or what we think is in somebody's mind stop us from doing something that God has commanded us to do. No excuses for that. You know what your job is? It's not to figure out who deserves to get served. It's just to serve. That's what God wants from us. And that's what we need to do. And so in verse 12, look at verse 12. It says, so after he had washed their feet and had taken his garments and was set down again, he said unto them, Know ye what I have done to you? Ye call me Master and Lord. Ye say, well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and Master, have washed your feet, ye ought also to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that ye should do as I have done unto you. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord, neither he that is sent greater than he that sent him. Now, folks, this is really, really clear right here. But listen, I, you know, I, I see so much of this in fundamentalism where I've been in some of these big churches where they have, you know, the high seats, uh, you know, the seats of prominence and importance, you know, in the meals and everything. And, you know, and they'll have, you have the people that just go falling all over themselves, you know, waiting on the preacher and the pastor. And, you know, the pastor's like the king. And he's got all these little servants around him. And you know, there's nothing wrong with people serving the pastor. But you know, the problem I have is when the preacher demands it, you know, expects it, puts on a big show of it, and then doesn't do it himself. I, I I got a huge problem with that. And I think God has a huge problem with that. It says the servant is not greater than his Lord. That, that's what the Bible clearly teaches. But yet we don't see that. I mean, there, you know, let's be honest. There is, there is hierarchies. There is what I call you know, pyramids of power within churches, within fundamentalism. Folks, that is so wrong. That is not what God wanted. That is not, what he, that is not the example that he set. None of us should be too good to do anything. Amen. We ought to be willing to do whatever needs to be done. You know, we, we should not be creating hierarchies. Hey, I understand that God made the pastor, you know, the shepherd of the church, the head of the church. I get that. But folks, where does that make the pastor better than everyone else? Okay. How can you be a shepherd 
you know, if there's no flock, I guess you could say. You know, and a, a flock is absolutely necessary. A pastor is nothing without the flock. And, and just because he has a different role, it doesn't mean he's better. Just like the husband is the head of the wife. But does that mean the husband's better than the wife? Absolutely not. You know, and, you know, they're, they're all equal. And we do, we have to, we have to serve one another. And if anything, we should see ourselves as lower than everyone else. Look at Philippians chapter two, verse three. This passage is pretty clear right here. Another well-known passage of scripture, but one I think we forget sometimes it says, let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. I should think everybody's better than me. And they, oh, well, you know, how, you know, that's going to be impossible for some of these guys. You know I mean? Some of these preachers are so smart. They've got so much knowledge. They're so holy. Uh, they have so much wisdom, you know, but listen, you know, one of the things that every once in a while, I just kind of get convicted about whenever I start feeling like a big shot. I think about all that God has given me. I think about the fact I grew up in a preacher's home that I've been around the ministry my entire life. I got saved when I was five years old. You know, I was taught the word of God. I've been, you know, I was taught to read the Bible at a young age. I mean, my dad really motivated me and caused me to love reading the Bible. And I did, I, I started reading the Bible regularly at nine years old. And I pretty much read through the Bible at least once every year since I was nine years old. Now, when I start thinking about that, I don't see where I get any credit for that. When I think about the preachers that I've had in my life, when I think about, you know, the, uh, you know, just some of the people in the church, some, even my, some of my Sunday school teachers and stuff, there's the people who have invested in my life, who have been a blessing to me, who have been an example to me. When I start thinking about all that God has given me, and then I think about other people who God hasn't given them near what he gave me, and I see the kind of life they're living, I start to think, you know, I'm really not that great. I'm probably... You know, if I'm going to be, I'm not, I'm not trying to be humble right now, but you know, I would think probably more of a disappointment because to whom much is given is much required. So I can't really brag about anything when I start getting real honest. And so I, and I do, I think it's important that we do that, you know, let each esteem other better than themselves. But in order for us to do that, we have to do what verse four says, look, not every man on his own things but every man also on the things of others. If I start getting caught up in myself and what I need, what I'm expected, then, you know, it's going to be easy for me to get self-centered and selfish. And I'm not going to care about other people's needs. You know, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men, and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross, wherefore God also hath highly exalted him, and given him a name which is above every name. So notice, Jesus didn't do that to himself. God did that. Why did God do that? Well, because of how much he humbled himself. And think, think about this. You know, no, who has humbled themselves? More than Jesus Christ. I mean, you can't humble yourself more than that. Here he is. He's equal with God. And yet he humbles himself as a servant on earth, dies a horrible, humiliating death. None of us are capable of lowering ourselves that much. You know, we can try to lower ourselves, but it's like we don't have far to go because we're not too high to begin with. Here he is way up there. And yet he lowers himself. So God says, all right. You're going way up here. You're going top. Your name is the name above all names. Now, listen, we are all capable of lowering ourselves. And I do. I believe the more we lower ourselves, the more that God can exalt us. But understand, none of us are. It's not even possible for us to lower ourselves more than Jesus Christ did. But I believe if we would, if we would lower ourselves, if we would have that lowliness of mind, I do believe that God would exalt us. And so, but you do first, you have to be humble. You have to be a servant. Well, how long do I have to be a servant for? When can I be the big boss and start giving orders? Well, Jesus did it until he died. And so, uh, yeah, just do that until you die. And then you can worry about your rewards in the millennial kingdom. All right. So in the mean, just, just plan on serving, 
plan on, plan on being humble for the rest of your life. This, let that be the plan. Just like, let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus. That's what he did, and that's what we ought to do. And so, uh, look at what it says in verse 17. Verse 17. If ye know these things, happy are ye if ye do them. Now, I could preach a whole message on this right here. If you'll do these things, if you'll serve each other, if you'll love each other, if you will realize, hey, you're not a big shot. If you'll realize, you know what, you're lower than everyone else. The Bible says... You'll be happy if you do these things. Now, wait a minute. I think I would be happier if, ever, if I'm the big shot, if everyone's waiting on me, you know, if I'm, if I'm giving orders. But you know, one of the reasons for many people's unhappiness, you know why so many people are miserable even in America? It's because they feel like they haven't got what they deserve. They're always looking at everybody else who's got nicer cars, nicer houses, more money than they do. You know, you got these people, they sit around on Facebook, they see what everybody else is doing. Oh, they're having so much more fun than me. You know, why did they get to do this? I, I should be able to do these things. I should have that. What, what are they doing? They're constantly comparing themselves with other people, thinking they deserve more. And, because, and it makes them miserable. You know, how many, you know how many women, I guess probably some men do it too, but you know, I like to pick on women. All right, you know how many women, they'll go on Facebook and get depressed because they see good things happening to other people. Now, why would that make you depressed? You know why? Because they esteem themselves better than them. And they're thinking, I should have, I should have those things. But listen, if you have the attitude that everyone else is better than you, if you have the attitude that I want to serve other people, I want to live my life for other people, then you know what? Other people's success is your success. Other people's victory is your victory. Other people's happiness is your happiness. But for many, because of their self-centered attitude, other people's happiness is their misery. And you understand that if, if that's you, if you get happy because of those things, the answer to your problems is not more money and you get more of everything. No, you need to change your life. You need to change your attitude. You need to humble yourself. You need to start being a servant to other people. That is exactly what you need to do. And, you know, they do, they, but they do, they get down when they see others being more blessed than they are. And that, that's a sorry attitude. And that is not the attitude of a servant. Amen. And if you'll have that attitude of a servant, the Bible says, happy. You will be happy if you do those things. And, and so, verse 18, I speak not of you all. I know whom I have chosen, but that the scripture may be fulfilled. He that eateth bread with me hath lifted up his heel against me. Now I tell you before it come, that when it come to pass, ye may believe that I am he. Notice Jesus knew all along that Judas was going to betray him. Because keep that in mind. He washed Judas' feet, knowing that Judas was going to betray him. In fact, we see in John chapter 6, verse 64, it says, But there are some of you that believe not, for Jesus knew from the beginning who they were that believed not, and who should betray him. From the beginning, Jesus knew who Judas was. He, Jesus knew from the beginning that he was not a believer. He knew that he would betray him one of these days. Yet Jesus loved Judas, didn't he? Jesus was good to Judas, wasn't he? And we see Jesus was close enough to Judas that even when Jesus, Judas betrayed him, he'd said the way he was going to identify Jesus was with a kiss. You know, he, it was like he didn't even have the guts to stand there with the soldiers and say, that's him, go get him. What did he do? Whenever the soldiers were present, you know, he goes up to Jesus. It's like he's acting like everything's okay. Everything's fine. Greets him with a kiss. And then thinking, Jesus won't know it's me that betrayed him. But what did Jesus say? Judas betrayest thou me with a kiss. You know, Jesus, Jesus knew what was going on. Jesus always knew what was going on. And yet he still loved Judas. He still served him. In fact, not only did Jesus know way back there in John chapter 6, we see Jesus actually knew hundreds of years before in Psalms chapter 41 and verse 9. Uh, John chapter 13 quotes it. It says, Yea, mine own familiar friend in whom I trusted, which did eat of my bread, hath lifted up his heel against me. So, you know, you don't, you're not going to put anything past Jesus, all right? It was way back there in Psalms. 
that this was going to happen. And what's funny about this too, you know, the disciples, we're going to see more over here, they're, they're asking, but they're not getting this whole betrayal thing. When G- Jesus, you know, flat out tells them, and it's like they don't get it, they don't understand it. But you know what? It was prophesied way back in the book of Psalms, but it was just one of those prophecies that went right over the head. Uh, they realized later, after, after everything was all done. And so, uh, look what it says in verse 20. Uh, I like this verse right here. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that receiveth whomsoever I send receiveth me, and he that receiveth me receiveth him that sent me. Now, this, this is an important verse right here. What he's saying is, you, what it's talking about here, this is another example, this is another verse people try to use to teach that Jesus is the Father. You know, if you receive me, you receive the Father. That's not what he's saying right here. And I can prove that to you real easy because he says, if you receive whoever I send, you receive me. And if you receive me, you receive him that sent me. So if God sends me somewhere and you receive me, did you just, you know, does that mean I'm the Father? No, that's not what that means at all. And it's the same thing with Jesus. But what he's saying right here, when it talks about receiving someone, what it's specifically talking about, it's when you do them good, when you serve them, when you're a blessing to them. Um, you know, you serving those who God has sent is the exact same thing as serving God himself. Look at what it says in Matthew chapter 10. Matthew chapter 10, he's saying the same thing here, but I think it's a little more clear uh, what he's saying. Matthew chapter 10 and verse 42. It says, and whosoever, sh- or uh, let's start reading in verse 40. Or, yeah, verse 40. He that receiveth you, receiveth me. And he that receiveth me, receiveth him that sent me. Okay, once again, you know, showing that uh, it's the same thing. If God sends someone, you receive them. It's just like receiving Jesus or receiving the Father. He that receiveth the prophet in the name of a prophet shall receive a prophet's reward. And he that receiveth the righteous man in the name of a righteous man shall receive a righteous man's reward. And whosoever shall give to drink unto one of these little ones a cup of cold water only in the name of a disciple, verily I say unto you, he shall in no wise lose his reward. Y'all see that? Talking about, you know, and if you'll just even, I mean, give a cold cup of water to a child, you know, in the name of a disciple, you are not going to lose your reward. And so understand, whenever we do things for others, in the name of Jesus, it's the same thing like we're doing it for Him. Isn't that what He said too? You know, I was sick and in prison and He visited me. I was hungry, He gave me meat. When do we do that? When He did the least of these, my brethren. So understand, that's talking about serving each other. When we serve each other, when we physically serve each other, it is the exact same thing as doing it for Jesus Christ Himself. But what if they, no, 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 it's not because they don't deserve it. doesn't matter. Jesus did it for those who didn't deserve it. And so we ought to do that. It's the exact same thing. And, you know, G, I mean, we would, we would be falling all over each other to serve Jesus if Jesus was here, wouldn't we? I mean, even if the apostle Peter showed up, we would fall all over ourselves to serve him. Why? Because he's a big shot. Because he's famous. Because he was that apostle. Well, isn't that total opposite of what Jesus was trying to teach? You know, Jesus was all about faith. It was all about believing him. And when he says, if you'll receive one that I've sent, you receive me, he expects us to believe that. When he talks about doing things for others, it being the same as doing it for him, he expects us to believe that. We would be thrilled if we physically could go and, you know, do something for Jesus Christ himself in the presence of Jesus Christ himself. And you know what? If we actually have faith, like we say we do, we ought to feel the exact same way when we're serving other people in the church. That is what he has told us to do. We have no excuses for not doing that. And so, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's very clear. You know, we, we need to be serving everybody we can. It's the same thing as serving Jesus. Jesus physically is not here right now, but we are here and we can serve him by serving others. And so look what it says in verse 21. When Jesus had thus said, he was troubled in spirit and testified and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, that one of you shall betray me. Pretty clear right there. Then the disciples looked one on another, doubting of whom he spake. Now there was leaning on Jesus' bosom one of his disciples whom Jesus loved. 
Simon Peter therefore beckoned to him that he should ask who it should be of whom he spake. They're all curious and wanting to know. And Peter is kind of like motioning to John. You, you ask him. They want to know. Okay. Have your kids ever done that before? Where it's like they know they're not supposed to ask a question. And so they send one of their brothers or sisters to ask the question. All right. My kids do that quite a bit. A lot of times they send Lana uh, to go ask the questions that they are all afraid to ask. And they are, they're kind of scared of this because it's like they have doubt in themselves. And Jesus is saying, somebody here is going to betray me. And, you know, it's like they want to know. And then one of the other gospels, they're all saying, you know, is it I? You know, is it I? And, and they're wanting to know. And so Peter, he kind of tells John, you know, ask him. You know, you, you, you be the one to ask him. And then it says in verse 25, he then lying on Jesus' breast saith unto him, Lord, who is it? Jesus answered, he it is to whom I shall give a sop when I have dipped it. And when he had dipped the sop, he gave it to Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. So Jesus said, the one who's going to betray me, I'm going to dip a sop and I'm going to give it to someone. And the one I give it to is the one who's going to betray me. And so Jesus does exactly what he says. And he hands the sop to Judas. And in verse 27, after the sop, Satan entered into him. Then said Jesus unto him, that thou doest, do quickly. Now no man at the table knew for what he intent he had spake unto him. For some of them thought, because Judas had the bag that Jesus had said unto him, buy those things which we have need of against the feast, or that he should give something to the poor. And so there, even after Jesus said, the one I give, that's him. He gives it to him. What thou doest, do quickly. And then uh, he must be telling them to go get something. They still didn't see it. It's amazing how many things Jesus just spelled out for them and they didn't get just because just, it wasn't what they were expecting. And, it, you know, they were, they, they did, those guys didn't have a lot of faith. <laughs> they, they really didn't. And so, uh, you know, he tell, um, you know, th- so it's like they didn't pay a whole lot of attention to the message, you know, but they were, they were interested in who the betrayer was. You know, they were very interested in that because they're thinking, good, somebody's going to get demoted and that'll move me up a peg. And that, was pro- that was probably how they were thinking, knowing the disciples. And so notice though how it says that Satan entered into Judas. Okay, Satan now, I mean, he is, he is possessed, or Judas is possessed by Satan himself. And Jesus looks at him and says, what thou doest, do quickly. Now this is an important thing I want us to get, I want you to get right here. Is Jesus Christ is Lord over everything and everyone. Okay. All right. Now, you know, Brother Perry, he had just put a video out talking about uh, Joel 2 and the locusts and the angel. And he was uh, talking about how, you know, th- there's an angel, Abad- Abaddon and Apollyon and all that. I'll show you that verse here in a little bit. And he was talking about how, you know, Jesus, you know, is over that. And then somebody is out there, you know, trying to just mit- twisting his words and making it like, you know, he thinks that Jesus and Apollyon are the same. Okay. Now, first of all, that's just, you know, that, that is not what he was saying at all. But you know what? Jesus is Lord even over the devils. Okay. He's Lord over everything. And notice right here, Jesus tells Satan what to do and Satan does it. Okay. Now, that doesn't, and that doesn't make Jesus responsible for all the wicked that goes on in the world. But do you understand anything that happens, he allows it to happen. Okay. And, uh, you know, you know, there, there is nothing that happens that is out of his control. Okay. When Jesus got betrayed, it wasn't that, you know, his plan got messed up. That was his plan all along. Okay. And anything that Satan does, it's because God allows him to do it. And we need to understand that too. Cause we're always like, Oh, the devil made me do it. Or, you know, the devil caused this to happen. Well, listen, if the devil caused that to happen in your life, it's because God allowed him to do that. You need to stop worrying about the devil and stop, start worrying about God. Amen. Okay. That's the one you need to be thinking about. We don't need to sit around being scared of the devil. All right. We need to fear God. All right. And that, that's the attitude we need to have because anything the devil does to me is going to be because God allowed him to do it because God is Lord of the devil yeah. and he is, he is Lord over the demons. He is Lord over everyone and everything. He is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So just get that, understand that. And it doesn't mean Jesus is bad when he lets those things happen. If those things happen, listen, it's our own fault. Because God gives us a free will too, doesn't he? And sometimes we ask for these things. And God will let Satan and maybe let Satan's demons do things to us and let bad things happen to us. And it's not 
necessarily, you know, it's, it's not the devil's fault. And we can't blame God. It's our fault. And so right here we do. We see Jesus give Satan a direct order and he carried it out, didn't he? And if, listen, if God wanted to, if it was his will and it was his plan, Satan would get thrown in the lake of fire so fast it wouldn't even be funny. Yeah. But that's not God's plan right now. God is allowing Satan to do his thing. Okay, so don't be scared of Satan. Be scared of God. Okay, fear God. Stay close to God. Satan can't do anything without God's permission because he is Lord over everything. And so, uh, you know, that, you know, once again, that what, what he was doing, trying to twist Brother Perry's word, it ticked me off. I was like, you're an idiot. You know, that's not even close to what he was trying to say. And that's just, that's being ignorant on purpose because you're wanting to, you're wanting to prove a point. That's all that is. And so, uh, and let me show you a few verses here to kind of go along with that because it says in Re uh, Revelation 9 11, they had a king over them, which is the angel of the bottomless pit whose name in the Hebrew tongue is Abaddon, and the Greek tongue hath his name Apollyon. All right? So now this angel over the bottomless pit, okay, it's an angel. Is it a good angel? Is it a bad angel? It's the angel of the bottomless pit. Does that mean he lives in the bottomless pit? Or does that mean he's a an good angel that keeps the bottomless pit locked up? Whatever. You know what? It really doesn't matter. I really don't care. Okay? But that name, it means destroyer. Okay? And look at what it says in Exodus chapter 12, verse 23. It says, For the Lord will pass through to smite the Egyptians, and when he seeth the blood upon the lintel and upon the two side posts, the Lord will pass over the door and will not suffer the destroyer to come into your house to smite you. I don't know my opinion. That might be the same angel right there. Now, is that a good angel? Is it a bad angel? I don't know. It really doesn't matter. Look at what it says in First Chronicles 21, verse 15. It says, And God sent an angel unto Jerusalem to destroy it. And as he was destroying, the Lord beheld, and he repented him of the evil, and said to the angel that destroyed it, It is enough. Stay now thine hand. And the angel of the Lord stood by the threshing floor of Ornan the Jebusite. And David lifted up his eyes and saw the angel of the Lord standing between the earth and the heaven, having a drawn sword in his hand stretched over out over Jerusalem. Then David and the elders of Israel who were clothed in sackcloth fell upon their face. We see a destroying angel again. Maybe the same one. I don't know. Is this a good angel or a bad angel? Well, you could say it's a bad angel. And whenever God gives it the permission to kill, it just goes crazy. But either way, you know, but it, it could be a good and a holy angel and it can kill those who deserve it. And it's still holy, isn't it? Either way, whose orders was it acting on? It was acting on God's orders. God started it. God, God stopped it. And uh, look what it says in uh, Revelation 9 verse 13. It says, And the sixth angel sounded, and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God, saying to the sixth angel, which had the trumpet, Loose the four angels which are bound in the great river Euphrates, and the four angels were loose, which were prepared for an hour and a day and a month and a year for to slay a third part of the men. Now, I think it's safe to say these ones for sure were bad angels because they're bound, aren't they? They're bound in the river Euphrates, four of them. And they go, and so I think it's safe to say these are bad angels that have to be chained up, that have to be, that have to be bound. And, but at the same time, who gives the order to let them loose? They can kill a third of the men. It was, it was God, wasn't it? It was God that gave permission. So either way, whether angels are good or bad, you know who's Lord over them? Jesus Christ is Lord over those things. If he wants those bad angels, if, he's got, if he wants to allow them to serve his purpose, they cannot go beyond anything he allows them to do. And so, um, you know, so what Brother Perry was saying from Revelation 9 was completely appropriate. And just and and I think I think dead on accurate. Jude one nine says, "Yet Michael the archangel, when c contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses. Durst not bring against him a railing accusation, but said, The Lord rebuke thee.' Okay? Notice how he stopped. You know, the Lord rebuke thee. He called what he's the Lord. Why? How did that work against the devil? You know why? Because Jesus is Lord even over the devil. He is the one that is in control." over everything. And so that's why we see sometimes you see angels doing really bad things. Are those bad angels or are they good angels? It doesn't really matter. Either way, 
God's one in control over them. I'm not scared of bad angels. I'm not scared of good angels. I'm scared of the Father. I'm, or I'm scared. I'm scared of God. Amen. What does it say? You know, it says not to offend one of these little ones. For their angels do always behold the face of my Father. What are they doing? They're looking to God. Do I have permission to go kill that guy who offended that little child? Yeah. They're not going to do anything to that person unless God gives them the okay. So when it, when it comes to angels, when it comes to the devil, when it comes to demons, okay, the demons, they listen to Jesus. You know, they saw Jesus, they fell on their face. Art thou come to destroy us before the time? You know, allow us to be going to the herd of swine. You know, what are they? They're going to him for permission because they know Jesus Christ has control over them because he is Lord over everything. Even the winds and seas obey him. Once again, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And so I say all this just to say that God is in control, even of the bad angels. He's Lord of Lords. Lord over everything. He's Lord over our government. Okay, as wicked as it is, it's God's allowing it because that's what we deserve. Yeah. We deserve it. And so God's going to put people like we've got in office. We, don't, we, we deserve these people that we have. And you know what? If we would get right, then you know what? I, think, I don't think God would give us new politicians. I think he changed the hearts of the ones we have right now. You know, God doesn't need different people in office. You know, God needs us as Americans to get our act together and to turn back to him. And if we would do that, then I think, I think we would see some huge improvements. Amen. I think we might see some good decisions, even out of some of these people that we just hate and despise and are disgusted by. Because, you know, you know the heart of the king, it's, it's in the hand of God. We need to understand that. He's the one we need to be thinking about. So Jesus, uh, look at verse 31 real, qu real quickly. Let's go through this. It says, Theref uh, Therefore, when he was gone out, Jesus said, Now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God be glorified in him, God shall also glorify him in himself, and shall straightway glorify him. Little children, yet a little while I am with you. Ye shall seek me, as I have said unto the Jews, Whither I go, ye cannot come. So now I say to you, a new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one to another. Simon Peter said unto him, Lord, whither goest thou? Jesus answered him, whither I go, thou canst not follow me now, but thou shalt follow me afterwards. I think right there is just uh, another way of saying, you know, I'm going to rise from the dead. You can't follow me now where I'm going. But afterwards, you'll be able to follow me because he was going to come back to life. He was going to rise again. And Peter, verse 37, Peter saith, said unto him, Lord, why cannot I follow thee now? I will lay down my life for thy sake. Jesus answered him, Wilt thou lay down thy life for my sake? Verily, verily, I say unto thee, the cock shall not crow till thou hast denied me thrice. So we see again, Jesus knew what was coming. Jesus, Jesus had no doubt. You know, and so Jesus, once again, in this passage, he's given an important lesson about loving each other. Okay, and what's, while, while you can say the theme of this, the lesson he's trying to teach is to serve one another. But listen, when it comes to serving one another, serving can kind of become a chore, can it? Serving can get kind of old and monotonous and tiring. But listen, when you love someone, okay, when you're doing things, when your motivation is love, you don't think about that as much, do you? You don't think about how tired you are. You don't think about whether they deserve it or whether they don't deserve it. That's not the thought. That's not, that's not the motivation, okay? When, a per, when you love someone, it's really not a question, is it? You, you don't even think about it, okay? When that baby has that explosive diaper that just smells horrible, you know, the mom doesn't look at that baby and, do I change that or, or do I let it sleep in it all night? No, they, they don't think that. Okay, they, Now, they don't have any fun changing it. But listen, it's not a question of whether or not they're going to do it. They love that baby. It's not healthy for them to lay in that all night long. And so they're going to they're take care of that. And when we love each other, it's not going to be a question of, do I serve? No, we're going to do it because we love each other. We see the needs that are there and we will. We'll do it. We'll do the work. We'll do the labor. It's not going to matter. We'll, we'll be willing to humble ourselves. 
And listen, if Jesus Christ, the Master and Lord, could love and serve those that He knew, uh, you know, that if they were willing, if they were, if He was willing to do that for them, even though He knew they were going to deny Him, even though they knew they were going to betray Him, we ought to be able to do that for each other. None of us can stoop as low as Jesus did. If Jesus could wash his disciples' feet, we ought to be willing to do anything for anybody. And if we love each other like we're supposed to, that won't even be that won't be a problem. We'll do it, we'll make it happen, we'll figure out how to do it. And so I hope that was helped to you tonight. So with that, let's all stand.